whoever's late. It's like Jim and Barbara and Leslie will get a repeat. <laughs> Leslie already knows how the story ends, so uh, <laughs> she was here Monday. So I'm a week behind in this class because of last week. Uh, I do need you to, to think about something. So the first week of May, um, which I think that, that that Thursday is the 5th or 6th, six, 6th, I think. Uh, I have a prior commitment, so if I, if I give you enough heads up and remind you enough times, could y'all come on that Wednesday, the whatever that date is? 5th, so that all right? Y'all wouldn't? So, okay. But, so that, I'll let you know, uh, but I, I have a, I have a commitment that Thursday already. And with the senior, you know, coming up, I got all kinds of commitments, so uh, things are popping on my calendar now, so. Anyway, we'll finish judges, but just be flexible. I'll give you a heads up. Oh, we might move it to a Wednesday or a Tuesday. And it'll be sometime in June when we finish. So, anyway. So, all right. We're going to start Gideon uh, tonight. And uh, probably take two weeks to do Gideon, a week to do Abimelech, a week to do Jephthah, two weeks to do Samson. And if you got in the class late, I started at the end and worked backwards still for a while. So we, we, we finished at chapter 16. <laughs> we started in chapter 17. So. Anyway, so uh, Gideon, chapter 6. And maybe just a sneak peek at chapter 7. So. All right, let's pray. Uh, Father, for the blessing of the day and the rain that you sent us, Thank you for reminding us of your care for your creation and for those of us who live in it. And we pray, Father, that uh, hearts and minds will be open tonight as we reflect upon another of the judges from this really interesting period of uh, the history of your people. Thank you for Jesus uh, who saves us and walks with us, and it's through him we pray. Amen. So, um, Gideon. We got 40 years of rest from Deborah, then the cycle repeats. By the way, in the history of the judges, we have reached the, the high point. Right. Deborah was the best of the offerings, uh, Deborah and Barak. And from this point on, the reason that I started in chapter 17 and did 17 through 21 first was to show you uh, just the moral and ethical decay of the nation. Uh, and it really starts, you start seeing it with Gideon. Um, so uh, there's a downturn, not only in the character of the people, there's a downturn in the character of the judges. Uh, they're raised up, but they are anything, in my opinion, but they're not stellar, right? Uh, their ethic is questionable. They have their moments. Uh, so the ones that we're going to study over the next five weeks, Gideon and Jephthah and Samson, believe it or not, are all in Hebrews 11. And their resumes are not good. Wouldn't hire them if they came looking for a job around here. But there was some things. They did have their moments, which is, I think, why they're in there. They had their moments. So the other thing about Gideon is Gideon's the judgeship of Gideon is a microcosm of the whole cycle of the judges. Idolatry, some moments of clarity that God's God, some action back to idolatry. And Gideon does it all himself. And so um, it's, it, Gideon is the story of judges. And, and in a lot of ways, Gideon is, is the story of humanity. Uh, hard time overcoming our culture uh, at times. So, uh, so that's a little intro to Gideon. Uh, so the Midianites are the oppressing force. Remember that 
that Moses' in-laws are from Midian. So we've got another tie to Moses. We had a tie in the Deborah story with uh, Heber and Yael, the Kenites, which are from the clan of you know, Moses' in-laws. And so now we got the nation that Moses was really a citizen in for 40 years that are now oppressing uh, Israel. So their, their form of oppression is brilliant and unique to judges. Uh, in, uh, in the Ehud story, uh, Eglon oppressed through money, taxed you to death. Uh, in uh, Yavin, in the Deborah story, uh, Yavin uh, was physically abusive, just uh, really nasty. Right? Uh, the Midianites, you know, they said, if you don't eat, you don't live. We'll just take your food away. That's what they did. They leveraged, they took over the fields. Um, and so they, their oppression was in the form of food and housing. We'll kick you out of your house and we'll take over your land and we'll, we'll take over your crops. And uh, you, That's right. That's right. You want to eat, you will bow down. All right. Uh, so it's an, it's an interesting concept. Uh, so it's, it's a new form of oppression that you get in the, in the cycle of Judges. You get two other new things in Gideon, the Gideon story, two new elements that aren't before this. Uh, you get a prophet that shows up, an unnamed prophet, who gives an oracle uh, about what's going on in the land and why God's oppressing you because you didn't obey me, God says, through the prophets. So you get, you get a a foretaste of the school of the prophets that comes through Samuel uh, in this story. Uh, you also get another element in Gideon that's new, and that is an angel intervenes and does the call. Uh, so you got those two features that make the Gideon story you know, unique in its own way. And what you get in the character of Gideon is... Gideon moves, after the call, moves more and more to self-will and self-assertion. This, this is my deal, right? I'm the guy, and you need to know I'm the guy. Uh, and that's how Gideon moves uh, more and more toward that. Uh, so it's a, Gideon's story has uh, is, is got some unique features to it. Uh, uh, so here's what Gideon and his dad are. This is Greg's opinion. Uh, um, you can push back if you want to, but as I tell the Monday group, you always have the right to be wrong. Uh, so uh, Gideon and his dad are black market food dealers. In a land that has no food, they have food. Yeah, how do you get there? So you have to make a deal with somebody, right? So the Midianites are going to have enforcers, right? It's, it's the mafia concept, right? The Midianites got enforcers. So they're hiding food from the Midianites, but they're, they're really what they are. They're profiteers. Occupying Midianite forces. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so Gideon and his dad got to be making some backdoor deals somewhere. Why are they hiding it from the... We got picked out? I think because his dad has the altar to Baal, right, in the Asherah pole. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, he's, he's, he's got cred, right? He's got street cred. <laughs> right. Yeah, he's got, he's got the sign in front of his house, right? Uh, willing to make a deal. <laughs> so it's interesting that the text says that, get, that they're doing it to hide it from the Midianites, which means they're running a double, they're running a double scam, right? <laughs> uh, where the Midianites are controlling the food supply, and, you know, uh, you got somebody who's got to be somewhat in league with them, but also is running illegal contraband around them. So I don't think they're noble, is what I'm saying. I don't think that they're hiding food from the Midianites to give away to Israel out of the goodness of their heart. Yeah, they've got access to livestock. Right, because they've got livestock, right? Because they're getting, yeah. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. So you got to pay somebody off, right? You can't, you can't, it's not like you're going to hide a bull in a closet. Right? <laughs> you might could hide some grain in a wine press because normally the winnowing is done somewhere else. It's not done necessarily there. Uh, <clears throat> but you're not hiding an animal. And so, uh, or you're rebranding it and you, you've stuck the Midianite brand on it, right? Uh, yeah, they could have. So, but I think it's, this is, again, this is Greg's opinion <clears throat> about this, that, that uh, they're just black market food dealers, and they're, they're playing both sides. And listen, they got people. They got people uh, that will, when Gideon gets called, he, he's got people. Yeah. So he's got something to leverage. So I'm gonna, listen, he's a smart guy. Right. He's crafty. Uh, his name, I think, uh, the best I can tell, means hacker, not chopper. <laughs> That's what he does. Uh, at least his first name. He gets another one later. Uh, but the, the, the underlying, I think the underlying theme of the Gideon uh, saga is questions. Always questioning God, right? Uh, he's the ultimate doubter in a lot of ways. And maybe he's just trying to play God, right? I'm not play, act like God. That is to manipulate God in this whole story too. Uh, so you get a series of questions. So after the call, you get a little background. Uh, you get a call from the angel. And, and I think that there's a question in verse 13 uh, uh, when Gideon he couches it in, in this word. If I can let me read it. Uh, he's telling the angel, if the Lord is with us, then why does all this happen to us? You know, why are bad things happening to Israel if God's on our side, if we're God's people? Really, I think that the question, every question like that has a question behind the question. And I think the question behind the question is, that, does God really care? We're supposedly the covenant people of God does God really care? Now, you know, keep in mind that the prophets just said, you kind of broke the covenant here. Um, so, does God care? If, if God is with us, then why? And he you know, lists these things. And uh, so, I think that's doubt one. Does God really care about us? Even, even in our own, even if we do it to ourselves, right? And so, where's, where's the intervention here? Where's, where's God been for the last seven years as we've gone through this starvation, oppression that we've gone through? Uh, so that's kind of his first question. And he does a follow-up. And the follow-up is, uh, and again, it's, it's that there's a question behind the question. The follow-up is a bit of an excuse uh, how can I deliver Israel? In other words, the follow-up is, am I the right? You sure you got the right guy here? And then he gives his excuse. Uh, my clan's the weakest in Manasseh. Remember that Manasseh, in the blessings of, the, of Jacob, uh, which are, these are, this is Joseph's oldest, uh, Manasseh gets the double portion of land. And um, so... Gideon's going to say, well, we got the worst piece of the land, and my family's the worst of the family, and I'm the runt of the litter of the family, right? So this is, this is, this is the Moses thing, too, at the burning bush, right? Are you sure you got the right guy? I mean, here's I am. I'm, listen, I, I think this is false humility with Gideon based on his character. Uh, I think Gideon is... is living life pretty large with him and his dad and whatever they're doing with this secret food stuff. And, hey, don't mess that up, God. I got a good gig going. That would, listen, you know how that is. You get comfortable. You like what's going on around you. Ministry opportunities in front of you. You know, get somebody else. You know, I'm too old. I'm too young. Uh, I'm too weak. Uh, I'm too opinionated. I'm not opinionated enough. Uh, I'm not eloquent of speech. Uh, I just talk all the time and nobody listens. To, I mean, you know, just whatever, right? We, we're good at, 
what we really say is send somebody else. I like my life the way it is. You know, or, or we'll do, you know, I'll be glad to go do that, but, uh, you know, Jeopardy comes on at 6.30. <laughs> Don't want to miss Jeopardy. You know, they got cool guest hosts right now. <laughs> so am I the right one? So Gideon, though, I'm going to give Gideon a little bit of credit uh, here. Gideon says, well, you know what? If you'll show me a sign, you know, here's bargain number one. And by the way, this is, this is show me a sign part one. He gets really good at this. Okay. God, through the angel, says, I'll wait on you. What do you want? I'll, I'll do a magic trick for you. He makes, and much, much, again, there's another, this is another shadow uh, uh, toward the prophetic world. Uh, go make a sacrifice, bring it here. I got this cool stick, I'll burn it up. Right? This is what happens with Elijah at Mount Carmel, uh, except it's bigger and you know more grandiose on Mount Carmel. This is just a little sacrifice, but it's, it's gone. Okay. Hey, we're doing good, right? We got a sign. Okay, got him on board, kind of. <laughs> I'm kind of on board. So... Um, after he does that, then he gets a little fearful. Hey, maybe this is really God calling me, and maybe I shouldn't go. And then, but he's told to build an altar, and he builds an altar of peace uh, called the Lord's Peace. So, hey, he's done something good, right? Give him a check. So he gets in Hebrews 11. This isn't the only thing he does well, buddy. But then, right, after the first sign... And then the altar is built, so there's a response. <clears throat> the next question comes because there's a challenge. Uh, hey, you're come by, you know, come by from us and our black market food business sign, the the altar of Baal and the Asherah pole that's in Dad's front yard. Yeah, you need to go tear it down. Okay, so here's the first challenge, and then that, I think there's another question that comes through that from Gideon. God, who's going to take care of me when I do this? Right. So when I said Gideon's got people, right, he's got influence, he takes ten. It's a good, nice, biblical, symbolic number, right? <laughs> ten, it's a good number. And then uh, to, with him. He takes some muscle with him. Probably his mules <laughs> in the food business. In the middle of the night. Well, he's afraid of dad, for one. He's afraid of the consequences, for another. But he's also afraid of God. So he's hedging his bet a little bit. And maybe it's a big altar, right? I mean, maybe it takes a bunch of hackers to hack down the big altar. And uh, so he takes ten good, you know, good men. Just give me ten good men. There's a, there's a story somewhere about ten good people in a city, it seems like, with Abraham. <laughs> um, and again, to Gideon's credit, you know what he does? Tears down the altar. Hacks down the Asherah pole. Dad's got to be proud, right? <laughs> but he does it under the cloakness of darkness and secrecy, uh, I think he's still hedging his bet. Listen, I got a good side hustle. Mike can turn this. Mike can turn this. Again, that's that's me. I'm, as you can tell, I'm not a huge Gideon fan. <laughs> uh, not nearly as, as as excited about Gideon as the preacher in the in the in the Hebrew sermon. Uh, so, you know what you get? I think you get another sign. He doesn't ask for it like he does the first time. But when, when the accusations begin to fly, hey, who did this? And some, somebody rats on Gideon, right? He gets ratted out. He didn't pay, he didn't pay one of his mules enough <laughs> or whatever. He gets ratted out. Uh, and you know what happens, though? Dad comes to his defense I think that's sign number two for Gideon. Because dad says, hey, if Baal so great, let Baal defend Baal. 
I mean, if, if, if Baal or Baal's a god, then act like one. So, uh, by the way, that's, that's a pretty, that's very prophetic. That's what Elijah does on Mount Carmel. Hey, where's your God? Maybe God's asleep. Maybe he's refreshing himself. He's a little busy. I'll wait. Carmel? Oh, it's a ways. Yeah. I mean, they, they end up kind of at the edge of Jezreel again, the valley. But Carmel's going to be uh, west, across the valley from this. So, But it's, you know, you can probably see it if you get it out there to the valley, I guess. Never been out there. I guess I need to go so I can get a look and go, okay, that's... I'll get it now. <laughs> um, so, okay. Well, we'll do that. I'll bring pictures back. Okay. Yeah, I'll bring some swag back too. I will bring some swag back. So I think, listen, I think that if, if you are, are a little nervous, did I do the right thing here? The fact that your pagan worshiping Baal build, altar building dad says, you know what? Maybe this was the right thing to do. Hey. So he gets back in Hebrews 11. <laughs> so I've put him in, I've taken him out, I've put him in, I'll take, you know. Put him <laughs> I know I don't get a vote on that, so. <laughs> it's, already it's already been published, right? I can't edit it. So, uh, so you get two signs, right? Because I think what he really wants to know as he goes under the cloak of darkness and secrecy is who's going to take care of me if I do this? And, you know, the father figure takes care of him. Very symbolic. Uh, so, plus now you got ten people who go, hey, Gideon's got something going on here. Who probably already thought Gideon had something going on anyway. Oh, no, there's, there's never enough for Gideon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, he is, he is a proverbial give them an inch and they'll take a mile guy, right? Yeah, but you know what, Jesus, what happened with Jesus, right? He raises people from the dead and... Lame people walk and deaf people hear. And, and uh, you know, in, in, in John, you know, Jesus says, well, if you don't believe me, at least believe the signs. They didn't believe those either, right? Or they chose not to believe them. It was a trick, right? Staged. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, can you get that on, can you get that on eBay? <laughs> Uh, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Yeah. The rich man is in Haiti. He says, you know, let me go back and tell my brother. Tell my brother. Right. I believe somebody that's here from the dead. He said, if they don't believe those are the prophets, they won't. And I'm going to believe you either. That's right. So, right. yep. Yeah, you got to be suspect, right? Right. Yeah, so if you've watched any mafia movie, right, what's the one thing that's lacking in every mafia movie? Nobody trusts anybody, right? <laughs> Trust no one, right? And, uh, yeah, I think so. So listen, Dad comes to the to his defense and really ask a really good question, right? Who will who uh, will you contend for Baal, or will you defend his cause? And so, uh, so guess what? Gideon's going to get a new name. He goes from Gideon the hacker uh, to a new name. Jerubbabel, 
the one who opposes or contends against Baal. He's a, he's a demigod fighter, right? He's a pagan god fighter. Uh, he's an adversary of the pagans, which makes him now an adversary of the Midianites. Right. Uh, tore down the altar. The Midianites get really upset about this, by the way. It's interesting that uh, we don't get them, I guess because he's doing it in secrecy. They don't know about his side hustle stuff that he's doing. But man, they get fired up when Gideon gets exposed as the one who tears down the altar. So I wonder, I do wonder, and this is me thinking out loud only because I can, uh, are they really are they upset with the fact that their God has been attacked? Or are they upset that one of their who they thought were kind of one of their cohorts has come up against them? Right. Which is, leads me to believe that, that Gideon and his dad are in some kind of allegiance with the Midianites. Just because of their reaction. They're they they are really, really opposed to this. Uh, and, and I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how difficult it is to build an altar, and how sacred altars are in, in amongst the Midianite people. Is it really a religious? Is this really a religious thing, or is it a personality thing? Right, it's a people thing. Because uh, I think sometimes we we get upset and we we want to make it a religious thing, but it's not. It's just really about the person. You hurt me. Not that you violated some deep conviction of mine. I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering. Well, I mean, you think about it. It is, it's both. If we took something here in our world, in our, in our Sunday morning world, and we change it, somebody is going to get really, really upset. Yep. It's both, yeah. <laughs> and that can be as simple as uh, a lot of things, right? We flipped it when we uh, were doing you know, Bible class and, and worship. We flipped the times, did worship first. Man, it was contentious. We did away from, we moved from traditional Sunday night assemblies to small groups. Contentious. And it was both, right? It was they, there was personal things behind all those deals. Uh, well, you know, I mean, there was legitimate. Hey, that's too early for me. <laughs> Nine thirty, yeah. So okay, I mean, and maybe there was. I mean, some. I mean, there were some legitimate concerns about getting up and moving slow and getting here and you know aging and all those things. And, um, and but then there were just some that were personal. Right? Um, but when we started doing small graves, it was there was some really there was some deep seated personal things that had come out of people in previous places where small groups really uh, got ugly and divisive. So, but for whatever flares them, they get flared. The Midianites do, and so how long? Well, uh, they were there when Moses was around, so. Oh, so the the oppression's been seven years. Yeah, it's been a seven year oppression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but they also grab another former, you know, enemy uh, of of Israel too. Uh, so they grab the Amalekites, right? Who have a history uh, against of adversarial history with Israel. So they just don't like them, right? Um, so listen now, Gideon. So Gideon's done two things really well, right? Uh, he answers the call. He faces the first challenge. Uh, but guess what? I think doubt creeps in again. You know, it's all fun and games until somebody gets mad at you and comes at you, right? It's good to be the hero until you're the villain. <laughs> He's the villain, right? He's the bad guy, and. And then you get this, you get to me one of the strangest things in Judges that you get with Gideon, you get with Jephthah, 
and you get with Samson, and it makes no sense to me what it means. Right? And that is that the Spirit of the Lord took possession of Gideon. So, you got, you got two things that come, that come out of the altar piece, so to speak. Is one, typically when you get a name change, you get a character change, albeit sometimes slow. Jacob right, becomes Israel uh, slow. Abram becomes Abraham, right? Moshe becomes Moses. You get Simon, right, becomes Peter. And so uh, Saul becomes Paul. So you get, you, typically a name change is a transitional thing. You, you, your character seems to get better. Your ethic is more intact. Your, uh, you being in tune to God seems to grow along as, as you change. Uh, you treat people a little better. I don't know. I don't know about these last three judges, right? What it does. But whatever. So I think what happens is Gideon's having another moment, right? Uh oh, the Midianites are really mad, and I'm the guy on the wanted poster. Uh, so what I think the Spirit of the Lord does for him is bring him. This is another sign, right? Hey, so he rallies his troops. All right, well, guess what? Guess what we love to do in Judges? We love to fight, so we got another battle brewing. Junior high boys delight once again, right? All this sociological, theological stuff, let's, put, let's just go fight somebody, right? And it's not, you can't do that just yet with Gideon. Um, so uh, I, I just think it's, an, it's interesting because typically when you get the Spirit of the Lord, it, it, ha, it, it does, it's not just about power, right? There, there's a, it's about character too, at least the way that I think about it. Maybe we, and maybe I think about it incorrectly sometime. Yep. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one because the, what we know of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is almost absent in the Old. But, yeah, so it's the wind or the breath of God, right? I mean, it's still the same thing in Hebrew and Greek. Uh, is it manifested differently? I'd say yes. Um, it, uh, even the wording kinda, is kind of interesting because, you know, the Spirit of God from, from the wording that we get in the New Testament you know, we get the word falls on them in Acts 11, but what the rest of us, what we get is an indwelling spirit, right? Not, this almost seems to me when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon them, and maybe I'm taking a little bit too much liberty with some text here, but it seems to me this is an external thing that kind of gives them some juice for the moment, especially uh, Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson. Um, it seems to be that way. Uh, you know, Samson gets it and gets just goes crazy and can just beat things. <laughs> this comment in my Bible says literally clothed himself on. Yeah, yeah, um, like an external thing, right? Which I think to me that's that that's one of the differences that I that I have you know wrestled with about the Spirit of the Lord. In the Old New Testament, it seems to me that the New Testament focuses much more on an indwelling, right? Where the external, where the Old Testament is an external thing, uh, which that might be just being semantics, I, you know, on my part. Uh, Gideon is the least of his clan, but in the least of the clans, right. he would need something he, different to call the Israelites, right. to, to like they wouldn't normally listen to him in his socioeconomic status. Right. Yeah. So if 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 I'm and I'm and I could be wrong. So if I'm wrong about the false humility with Gideon in that, uh, was just using it as an excuse not to go. But if that's, I mean, the size thing's probably right. Right. The size of the clan, and that maybe not the importance. Uh, are their significance. So, yeah, he wouldn't have a... 
he's got 10 guys, right? <laughs> we know that. He's got 10. So, but whatever, whatever, however he's empowered, when he calls uh, the tribes to battle, they show up, right? A bunch of them do, right? Matter of fact, too many. Which we'll get to in chapter 7. Uh, so you think, okay, listen, Gideon, you're on, you're on a good plane again, right? Show me a sign. Okay, sacrifice, the, the offerings burn up. How about another sign? Dad defended me. How about another sign? I played the trumpet really well. <laughs> right? Okay. I play the trumpet and people show up. <laughs> this, is a, this is a good thing, right? So we're ready to go fight now, right? No more doubts. Everything is good. We've got the call uh, to go to, to war. We got the people to go to war. We got a God who's promised to be with us. We've got cool parlor tricks. We got my dad on my side, and I got this cool trumpet. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot. I'm Gideon. <laughs> Not enough, God. Uh, you got to ante up some more. So, you know he's got animals, right? Because he had a bull to sacrifice. Uh, and he's got sheep. Probably went, you know, I just... I just sacrificed a pretty healthy piece of profit there <laughs> with Dad's bull. <laughs> so another sign, right? Not ready to go just yet. So in the classic words of Gideon, and maybe in the character of Gideon, fleece me, God. <laughs> so in order to see, I, I just... The bargaining with God that this guy has, the nerve that he has to bargain with God, I'm going to give him that too, right? <laughs> In order to see whether you will deliver Israel by my hand, as you've said, I'm just going to let you do one more parlor trick for me, God. Okay. Um, I'm, going to th I'm going to throw this fleece down right in my secret uh, you know, food chamber. And see if you can do this. Let's just see how special you are. Let's see how your do radar is. <laughs> okay. Well, guess what? You know, do on the fleece, dry ground around, that I'll know, I will know, God, that this is the right thing. Guess what? What God does. All right, another part of the trick. I'll show it to you. He does it. Okay, I got my trumpet. Right, I got the wet fleece. I got the magic stick of the angel. I got dad's approval. Let's go. <laughs> oh yeah, God, uh, one more thing. <laughs> Just one more thing, would you? Which, oh, by the way, you know what God's doing for him and to him? God is just setting him up to say, okay, well, I'll let you play as long as you want to, but I'm going to turn the tables on you too. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to let you, I'm going to show you something coming up. So Gideon's not quite ready to go yet. One more, right? So Gideon said to God, please don't let your anger burn against me. Just one more thing. Let me speak one more time. One more fleece thing. Fleece me again. This time, just do the opposite. Everything else is wet. Let the fleece be dry. And God did so that night. Okay. Now. Now we're ready. Now we're ready. Right. Are we? I mean, Gideon is... 
Listen, Gideon is the classic guy of somebody needs to help as long as somebody didn't name me. He is the, you know, he is anything in my book but faithful and trusting of God. I mean, he tests God and tests God. The one thing maybe he does the best is test God. Maybe that's why he's in Hebrews 11, by the way. He's, he doesn't mind testing God. He's got enough faith in testing God that God will pass the test. I mean, he does go, right? He does tear down the altar. Um, but man, just like Abraham in my book, Abraham, for the most part of his life, proves to be anything but what we think about as faithful. Until it counts, right? Okay. Uh, well, listen, this, uh, this testing of God, right? Show me signs, show me signs, show me signs. Uh, we've been studying uh, Dallas Willard's book, Hearing God, uh, on Tuesday morning uh, with the Grumpy Old Man's Club. And um, Okay, well, the Grumpy Old Man plus Mark. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, and Kyle Killo. He forgot he's in that one. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> Um, but one of the things that uh, w- that Willard brought up in his book is we're, we're all, we, want it, we want these signs, right, that God's speaking. And he makes a really interesting statement, and I'll paraphrase it. The trouble with looking for signs is we start looking for signs. Right. And either we never get the right sign or we falsely interpret everything as a sign, right. or we ignore... Uh, the sign because it doesn't fit our, you know, our, our sensibilities, uh, and so we just instead of responding to God, we keep thinking. Once I get the sign, right? Once, once the signs get all lined up right, then I know that this is God, and so let's go. And I think we do that with jobs. We do that with ministry. We do that with people. Uh, some people do it with donuts. I mean, I mean, literally, you know, which donut shop to go to? Just get a sign. <laughs> I'm not doubting signs, okay? <laughs> what I'm saying is, is if you're if you're prone to be that person, you're going to be like Gideon. It's never going to be enough, right? Yeah, it, yeah, isn't that interesting, right? The Gideon Bible Group, right? The Gideon Publishing Company. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, I to tell you a funny story <laughs> about that. So uh, Mason was pretty young, and we went somewhere. He went to a hotel. And so, you know, he's the kid, right? He's a boy. And so you know what B.O.Ys do. They have to look in and touch everything and get involved. And so he opens up the desk drawer and he goes, this must be a Christian hotel. There's a Bible here. (laughs) Yep. Keep on believing that, dude. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, getting is... Yeah. Yeah. Put up a free Bible stand down there on campus, and UT wouldn't let them. Yeah. UT let the Muslims pass out Korans. But they wouldn't let the Gideon. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, the, the Gideon is so, he's so complex, isn't he? But he's so us sometimes. And uh, I, I know I'll give Gideon, I'll give Gideon a hard time, because uh, I know how the story ends, too. But um, it, it's, it is amazing to me that he does have these moments, though. I mean, he does blow the trumpet, and he does rally the troops, and he does go to war, and he does tear down the altar, uh, and he's, you know, nervous or not, he's going to live with the consequences of that. But man, does he hedge his bets against with God? I mean, this is Jacob's bargain at Bethel over and over and over again. And you know what? The beauty of this, because the hero of this story 
is the hero of every story in Judges. It's not the guy in the cape or the lady in the cape. It's God's the hero. Uh, God just says, okay. I'll let you test me. Isn't that what Jesus says to Thomas? Test me. That's kind of the message that the ladies at the tomb get in Mark's account of the resurrection. Go to Galilee. Jesus will be there. You know, to their credit, they went to Galilee. And guess who showed up? Jesus shows up. Uh, I mean, God's the one who's faithful here. And God takes us Gideons and says, okay, I'll play your little game. I'll walk along with you. And God never leaves Gideon, by the way. That's the beauty of a, a God who is the God of a covenant. God never leaves the covenant. No matter what you do, God never leaves the covenant. So, Je I mean, Gideon's question, if God is for us, why has this happened to us, is legitimate in its own way, right? What Gideon didn't realize is God's never left Israel, even though Israel left God. Um, and man, that if we can I think if we can get that in our head, God's not going to leave you. God's not this cosmic accountant who does what I do with Gideon and kick him in and out of Hebrews 11 every other page. Right. God stays with us. Right. So the question I have is, is, is we are heading obviously that direction, which leads me to ask, do we even know? Right. I think that is the question, right? Because you're right. What what happens as as the as the ethic and the character of the people of God, and even the judges that are called, seems to deteriorate more and more as the book goes on. I mean, it kind of rises up to Deborah, and then. And then when you get to the end of the book, the reason that you don't know if God's with us because you don't know God. You don't even know what you're looking for, right? I mean, and that's a, that's, a, that's a very legitimate question in our time. Where is God? Right? I mean, that's a legitimate question. That's, that's Gideon's question. Uh, and the reality is, is God's where God's always been, right here. But if you don't know God, you can't see God. Right? And you can't hear God. Yeah, the, the, the hard part for me, about one of the hard parts, there's a lot of hard parts of God for me, but right, how God can be transcendent and imminent at the same time. Right? Uh, which is why the incarnation is so vitally important to us. That, I mean, here, here is a walking, living, breathing manifestation of an imminent God who is with us. Yes, you can. Right. Or, or you can do what they do in Judges, which is religious syncretism, right? You can worship God on the, hall, on the festivals and worship Baal tomorrow. Right. Yeah. That's what's going on in Athens, right? When Paul goes to Athens in Acts 17. Oh, look, here's the one, just in case you left one out, right? The unknown God. We're going to cover all our bases here. Yeah, I'll tell you about that one, right? Uh, and listen, all God is doing with Gideon uh, is God is just shaping, informing, and conforming Gideon to fulfill this moment, right? Which he does. 
Yeah. 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 I think the question is, is what are you up to? <laughs> and, and, and then maybe the ultimate question then is what's in it for me? The sign stuff? Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say God's going to quit being God. The pro- again, I'll quote Willard, the problem of looking for signs is looking for signs is what are we seeing? We can make anything a sign from God, right? And we can also ignore signs from God. We can, we can rationalize them out of, our, out of existence, or we can fictionalize everything into, the, into a sign from God. And I don't, have a, I don't have a Pez dispenser answer for what that is, right? Or both, right? But I, I will say this. Here's the answer I can give you. The more that I am in tune to the will and way of God, the more likely I will see God show up. Right? And the more likely I will recognize God at work. In, in, in characters like Gideon even, right? Who, uh, you know, I'm sure I'm going to get some, some, Gideon, some Gideon fans are going to say, Greg, you're just too hard on that guy. <laughs> true but but you know what uh i've had plenty of gideon moments in my life i am gideon at times right hey that's not enough Yeah. It's more of a self doubt. Um, I, I see so many parallels with myself in Gideon. Um, and that, you know, God God picked Gideon because God saw a potential and knew it was there and knew the faith and the strength and the courage was there. But Gideon didn't see that in himself. He was, you know, he was his land, the hearts of the litter. Um, and so he. Good. Yeah. Now, listen, what, what Gideon does for me is what Abraham does for me, is what Jacob does for me, and I keep going back to, to Hebrews 11, it, it makes me redefine what faith is, right? Faith is not getting it right all the time. Yeah. I mean, what Gideon, what, what Gideon builds to in his life and what we'll get to 
uh, in seven, chapter 7 and 8 next week, is what Abraham got to in Genesis 22. I mean, Abraham knows before he goes on the mountain uh, that his son is coming back. He knows. I mean, he tells, he knows he's going to sacrifice him, and he tells his servants in Genesis 22, 5, we're going to go worship, you stay here, and we will be back. And that wasn't a mouse in his pocket, we, right? Uh, and so, I mean, all these things that we see with these really flawed characters, by the way, is this, God hangs around, and you hang around long enough to get your aha moment. Abraham got his aha moment at Moriah, and Gideon gets his on the battlefield of Jezreel. Right? And, but he gets these little moments, just like Abraham does in between. Right? Abraham tries to give the farm away. He leaves it once. He just vacates the farm. He tries to give it to his servant. He tries to give it to Ishmael. And God just reminds him, a few times. Hey, gives me here's the sign, here's circumcision, here's a reminder, here's the animals that I cut in half and the smoke coming through. It's a reminder. Until he gets there. So, anyway, we'll finish Gideon next week. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He is. He's the one God raises up, right? to be the signs of the nation, that God is present. He becomes, he becomes the manifested, embodied sign of God for the nation, just like Deborah does right, for Barak. Strange times they were living in, huh? So, And then, like I said, it, this is a microcosm of Judges. You'll see why I'm, I'm a, a bit anti-Gideon at the end. <laughs> we'll see about what he names his son. <laughs>